ಆಯ್ತು ಅಂತ ಅಂದ್ರು ಪ್ರಶಾಂತ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆಲ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅಂಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಟುಡೆ ಟುಡೆ ಸೆಷನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ವಿತ್ ವಿತ್ ಸ್ಪೀಚ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಫಾಲೋಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಪ್ರೇಯರ್ ಆರ್ ದ ವಚನ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಟ್ರಿಶಾ ಅಂಡ್ ಜಿಯಾ ಉಲಿ ಕೆರೆ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಫಾಲೋಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮಾರ್ಕಾವ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಜ್ಯೋತಿ ಜಗದೀಶ್ ದೆನ್ ದ ಕೀನೋಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಥಿಯೋಡರ್ ಮಾರ್ಕಾವ್ then followed by the question and answer we will be priority will be given to the pre submitted questions uh, if there is any time permits we will take the questions from the uh, from the zoom chat finally uh, we will be ending the program with a vote of thanks a uh, few house rules for today um, guests are requested to join uh, youtube or zoom whichever is convenient for you um, Uh, during the presentation we will be muting all the phones all the uh, zoom will be muted completely there will not be any chat there will not be any other uh, audio will be uh, muted uh, after the presentation then chat will be enabled but all those questions you can direct only to the host or the moderator to maintain the clarity zoom audio will be disabled to all the public at all times okay and zoom chat will be disabled for the public chatting you cannot chat yourself okay these are some of the house rules please follow these house rules to 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 her to the to success of this today's fr- fr- function finally welcome welcome you all and then we will start with the prayer or vachana <laughs> namaskar ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನನ್ನ ಹೆಸರು ತ್ರಿಷಾ ಹುಲಿಕೆರೆ ಹಾಗೆ ನನ್ನ ಹೆಸರು ಜಿಯ ಹುಲಿಕೆರೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಾವು ಗಣೇಶನ ಸ್ತುತಿಯಿಂದ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮವನ್ನು ಶುರು ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ನಂತರ ಸಣ್ಣ ವಚನವನ್ನು ಹಾಡುತ್ತೇವೆ ವಚನ ದ ನೇಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವಚನ ಇಸ್ ಎತ್ತನ ಮಾಮರ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೀಲಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಅನ್ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟೆಡ್ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನೋ ಮ್ಯಾರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಓರ್ ಹೌ ಬಿಗ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಆರ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫೈಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ರೈಸಿಸ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ This is what the Vachana Yetana Mamara teaches us. Vakra Tunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha ಎತ್ತಣ ಮಾಮರಾಯ 
ಎತ್ತಣ ಕೋಗಿಲೆ ಎತ್ತಣ ಮಾಮರ ಎತ್ತಣ ಕೋಗಿಲೆ ಎತ್ತಣಿಂದೆತ್ತ ಸಂಬಂಧವಯ್ಯ ಎತ್ತಣಿಂದೆತ್ತ ಸಂಬಂಧವಯ್ಯ ಎತ್ತಣ ಮಾಮರ thank you trisha thank you jia thank you for the melodious rendition thank you now the introduction of dr markao by dr jyoti jagdish ellarigu sharan sharan aarti welcome to covid 19 session with physicians our sincere thanks to vsny nj board of directors for organizing such great educational session you have no doubt heard many things about coronavirus and the vaccines that are being rolled out today we want to help you get the information so you and your family are well informed of new development and issues pertaining to pandemic as it continues to surge in many communities it's my great honor to introduce dr theodore marku an infectious disease specialist who did his id fellowship and graduated summa cum laude from john hopkins university he has affiliations at many atlantic health system hospitals including chilton medical center where i have had the opportunity to work closely with him for several years now dr marku has taken care of hundreds of outpatient and hospitalized covid-19 patients he finds excitement in tackling the unknown and helping heal patients He is also an infectious disease correspondent for RT America News Channel. Dr. Marku volunteers at a local Jiu Jitsu school for infection prevention to help curb outbreaks such as MRSA. He stays active with CrossFit, weightlifting, Jiu Jitsu, and is a professional dancer. He also enjoys brewing his own alcohol during his spare time. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming dr marku for further discussion hello everyone good evening um can you hear me all clearly yes we can hear you very good very good thank you dr jagadish for the generous uh, introduction um how do i share my screen or how do i um uh kind of uh, in the bottom you have share screen oh share okay and i guess that's up Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, perfect. Okay. We can see it. Very good. All right. So, I will be giving a brief yet I'll try to be as comprehensive as possible um view on the COVID-19 um virus in this 1 hour period. I hope this talk will be helpful for the naive and more experienced audience. Um so let's get started. So, um to start off, I have no disclosures. These views are my own and mine alone. not the views of any drug or manufacturing companies and i have not been paid by any hospital or pharmaceutical companies to share any of these views all right okay so what is uh covid oh actually i'm sorry uh so what is covid-19 um so here's our out outline for this lecture we will first discuss what covid-19 is we will have a basic review of the virus how it is transmitted and what symptoms it may cause we will then review the timeline of covid-19 from 2019 to the present and review all major events that happened during this time we will then take a look into the united states response to this pandemic which will then be followed by what is to be expected when exposed or infected with the covid-19 virus you will learn how to deal with an exposure and what to do and expect if you become ill from there we'll delve into the extremely hot topic of vaccines and I'll review all the major players and discuss the importance of vaccination and review some frequently asked questions we'll round up with a review of the major variants that have made big waves in the news i will give my own personal outlook and finally we'll review questions posed by you the audience members Okay. 
So what is COVID-19? Well, to start off, it is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses that are mainly known to cause respiratory infections in people. The most common coronavirus is the common cold, which I'm sure all of you have dealt with at some point in your life. COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which is another name for this virus, is a brand new virus which was first discovered in Wuhan, China. There are three major ways to contract this virus. The most likely way is the one portrayed in the middle, the droplets. As we breathe and talk, respiratory droplets are expressed from us and inhaled by people around us. If you are infected with COVID-19, you are exposing everyone around you with the virus. Objects that have been infected with droplet particles can also be modes of transmission. Finally, aerosols are very small particles which we breathe in. However, the virus is only spread in this manner very infrequently and only in certain situations, such as placing someone on a ventilator or using a machine to help them breathe. One second, I think I skipped the slide. Okay, there are five major factors that determine your chance for catching COVID-19. So we talked about how to spread and this is how effective the spread is. So the five factors are duration, distance, intensity, barriers, and ventilation. In regards to duration, we say any longer than 15 minutes puts you at risk for contracting COVID-19. For distance, we say any shorter than six feet is a risk factor as respiratory droplets rarely travel more than six feet. In regards to intensity, I am referring back to the volume of the activity. For instance, more respiratory particles are produced at a rock concert than at a quiet conversation in a library. Barriers to transmission refers to masks and wearing masks it decreases that risk. And finally, ventilation is how well ventilated an area is. The more airflow you have in an area, the lower chance you have of contracting the virus. Out of this list, ventilation is likely the most important factor. And I'll give you a short story that occurred very early in the pandemic in China. So there were two groups of people that went to a restaurant to talk about the finances of their competing companies. The more wealthy company had a very nice fancy room with silk curtains, gold chalices, the works. The up and coming company sat downstairs, nice room, but nothing very fancy about it. Each group had one person infected with coronavirus. A week later, all the members in the wealthy group had COVID-19, whereas the up and coming group had one or two members. Well, the reason? Poor ventilation. The fancy room's air conditioner had broke. Now think about it, same number of people, same activity, same restaurant, initially same number of people infected, only one in each group. The difference, the air conditioner and the ventilation. Okay, okay so these are the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. The most common symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, diarrhea, and loss of taste and smell. However, it seems like almost every other day we find a new symptom. The newest symptom, COVID tongue. You could see uh, it characterized by the small ulcers you see in these photos on the tongue. Okay, so how did we get here? On December 8th, 2019, a patient develops a viral pneumonia in Wuhan, China. Workup in the hospital was unrevealing. A few weeks later, hospitals around the area are reporting more cases of an unknown viral pneumonia. The virus is identified in the first week of January as a new coronavirus, possibly linking it to the seafood market uh, that was only miles away from the initial uh, hospital that the person was uh, infected. The virus begins to spread within Wuhan, China, leading to 130,000 deaths, 130, deaths, and strict lockdowns begin. 
but by then it is unfortunately too late. The virus is noted in Thailand and later in the United States. At the end of January, the WHO calls for a public health emergency. And as the virus continues to spread throughout the world, it is officially considered a pandemic in March of 2020. The virus continues to spread throughout the world almost unchecked and death tolls swell up throughout Asia, Europe and the continental Americas. And here we are now. As you can see, all parts of the world have COVID-19, except for Antarctica. Luckily, penguins don't get this virus. Okay. So unless you have been living under a rock for the past year, you have probably noticed that life has changed a little bit. From stay-at-home orders, to curfews, to restaurant closures, to closing down our borders, we have taken quite a few measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. But the main practices include social distancing, masking, hand hygiene, and restriction of large assemblies. So what is the science behind these practices? Do they actually work? Well, let's take a look. The graph on the left shows two different counties in Kansas. The brown line is a county without a mask mandate. The yellow one is a mask mandate county. As you can see in July, we saw another peak of cases. However, once a mask mandate was implemented, the cases in the yellow county remained at a steady state, whereas the counties in without the mask mandate skyrocketed. Now let's take a look at social distancing. This is the graph to the right. This was done as a case study in Germany. They looked at whether reducing physical contact with somebody would decrease COVID-19 chances. As you can see, the more they restricted physical contact with one another, the less cases they noted. When they took these restrictions away, as you can see, the cases skyrocketed every time. So what about hand washing? Well, they looked at army recruits washing their hands. Army recruits who washed their hands at least five times a day had a significant reduction in respiratory viruses compared to those who didn't. In regards to remote learning, the data is slightly mixed on this in regards to uh, limiting the virus. However, limiting a large number of people in one small room does limit the spread of a contagious virus throughout the community. So these are a few measures being taken by our governor in New Jersey. He issued a stay at home order from March till June. He limited indoor dining and made restaurants close early. He limited outdoor gatherings. Stores and grocery stores allowed special hours to limit traffic in and out of their stores to accommodate the elderly. Travel is recommended against to and from the state. Hospitals have shut their doors to the visiting public and are encouraging video conferencing. And Governor Murphy has also signed a mask mandate requiring individuals to wear masks when they cannot be far apart. So where has all this led us? Well, unfortunately, the cat was out of the bag, probably at some time at the end of January or February. And now we're just trying to catch up. This has led to now over 100 million cases worldwide. The US makes up for a quarter of these cases and New Jersey is number 12th in the ranking of these uh, in the United States. So given all that, there is high likelihood you have or you will come in contact with somebody with COVID-19. So what does an exposure mean? An exposure is contact with somebody who is positive or highly suspicious for COVID-19. Duration should be longer than 15 minutes and you, 
should be less than six feet in contact. As stated in the previous story, poor ventilation of a room increases your risk dramatically, but casual conversation and masking decreases that risk, but does not bring it down to zero. So let's say you were exposed. What do you do? Well, you monitor your symptoms. You check your temperature and your pulse oximetry. For those who don't know what a pulse oximetry is, it is a measurement of how much oxygen is in your blood. You can buy one of these devices at, the farm, at any pharmacy near you or an online store. You just place the device on your finger and it will read your heart rate and your oxygen level. You then want to alert all potential other contacts and you yourself would self quarantine at home and try to limit exposure to other members in your household. If you become symptomatic, meaning fever, cough, or shortness of breath, or any of the other symptoms that we discussed earlier, or your pulse oximeter is showing less than 94% oxygen, then you should go and get tested for COVID-19. And a test usually involves a nasal swab or saliva test. So let's say that you go to your friend's wedding. A few days later, he tells you the people sitting at your table tested positive for COVID-19. You stayed home for two days, but then began noticing fatigue. Things began tasting a little funny and you may have had a fever. You call up your doctor and he tests you for COVID-19. You are very worried. He calls you later that night and you are positive. So now we are positive. Is this the end of the world? Are we all going to perish from this? No, absolutely not. First of all, 40% of cases are completely asymptomatic. The younger and healthier you are, the less severe of a disease you will have. Another 40% of cases have very mild symptoms leading to mild fevers and aches. Think of it as a mild flu. Treatment for 80% of these cases is rest, hydration, and Netflix. Then for 20% of these cases, these cases might need to be seen by a physician or need to be seen in the emergency room. If your oxygen saturation drops below 90% at any point during COVID-19, you should seek immediate medical attention. So let's say you are in the unfortunate situation that you are ill enough to go to the hospital. What should you expect? Well, you will be evaluated by a doctor. And the main question that he or she has in, in their minds is how well you are breathing. If your oxygen levels are not very low, then you'll probably be discharged with a plan of rest, hydration, and Netflix. If you are older than 65, or 55 with multiple medical conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, heart problems, or lung problems, you might be eligible to get a synthetic antibody, which is meant to curb the virus in your body and prevent it from doing further harm. This is the drug that former President Trump got when he had COVID-19. If your oxygen level is too low though, then you are not eligible for this drug and you will be admitted to the hospital. Again, is this the end of the world? Again, absolutely not. 90% of patients who are admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 are discharged within a week. At the hospital, they're expected to receive oxygen, steroids, a blood thinner, and remdesivir, which is an antiviral that helps curb the virus if you are within the appropriate 10 day window. We have also noticed that laying on your belly also helps improve your breathing. So we ask patients with COVID-19 to lay flat on their stomachs for good parts of the day. Okay, 
And now on to our savior, our lifeline out of this entire mess, vaccines. There are at least another five to 10 vaccines in development. How I will mainly focus on the major players. And this is why this is so important. This slide is to demonstrate an r naught value. The r naught value displays how contagious a virus is. The higher the value, the more contagious. As you can see, measles, pictured at the bottom right corner, is extremely contagious, which means in order to contain the virus, you need over 90% of your population vaccinated. COVID is more contagious than influenza. However, thankfully, nowhere near measles. Based on this information, we need about 70 to 75% of the population vaccinated in order to prevent further spread. Okay, so now let's, this is the science of the vaccines. So put your science thinking caps on. As of right now, there are three major modes of the vaccine. The point of all these vaccines is to bind the spike protein to prevent it from infecting our cells. Think of a lock and key. Our cells have the lock on them and these viruses have keys on them. When you pair the right key with the right lock, you can open the door. These vaccines are developed to block that key from interact interacting with the lock and these are the ways how. So one way is to inject the protein that binds up the spike protein. Another way is to use a very weak virus that has been genetically mutated and infect the person. The mutated virus will then be introduced to the body, which will infect cells and produce proteins that block COVID-19. Lastly, the mRNA vaccines. These are our newest tools in vaccine development. We take very small fat particles and inject, inject the instruction manual of how to make blockers to the virus. We inject people with these fat particles and they interact with cells and use that instruction manual to make proteins to block the virus from truly infecting someone. So these are the major players of the three modes that we just discussed. The mRNA are made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. The protein base is out of Novavax. And the Frankenstein or the adenovirus vectors, the mutated viruses, are made by AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and Johnson & Johnson. Out of all these, the most effective vaccines are the mRNA vaccines. So people have a lot of questions regarding the side effects of vaccines. There are, they have been tested in over 100,000 people during these trials. And at this time, there have been over 2 million vaccines given around the world. The most common side effects are quite mild. Slight fever, fatigue, sore arm, and are usually a little bit more severe after the second shot if you are given an mRNA vaccine. Now, people who had COVID-19 are still recommended to get the vaccine to prolong their immunity. However, I will note that the side effects that you will get from the vaccine are much more prevalent than the normal public. Getting a COVID vaccine, if you've already had COVID, is like giving yourself a booster. You will feel like you've had COVID-19 all over again, but it will only last for two days. Okay, so these are some frequently asked questions regarding to COVID-19. The first question is who should not be vaccinated? At this time, there's only one major contraindication. If you have a polyethylene glycol allergy or a polysorbate allergy, then you should likely not be vaccinated. Everyone else should be vaccinated. Or if there are questions, then you should have a detailed discussion with your physician. Now, I will say that there are some reports of anaphylaxis, which means an extreme allergic response to the uh, COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. However, this is about a six in a million chance 
for the Pfizer vaccine and a two in a million chance for the Moderna vaccine. On the other hand, the chance of dying from severe COVID if infected is 1.6%. So you could imagine that six in a million and two in a million are much, much lower than 1.6%. The second question, will my child be vaccinated? Well, at this time, the vaccines have not been tested in children. However, trials are being done, so we hope by the early fall. The third question is regarding fertility. This was started as a false campaign on the internet. There was a lot of campaign started, which said the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines will induce infertility in women. There is no sound evidence to suggest this. On the other hand, there is good data to suggest that infertility may be induced by COVID-19, the actual virus. A study done in men showed young men infected with COVID-19 had severely altered sperm, which likely affected th their fertility. Whether or not this is permanent or temporary is not clear at this time. Four, I do not want to be a test subject for these vaccines. Well, you don't have to worry about that. At this point, millions of people had the vaccine and we discussed about the side effects before. Fifth, mRNA is a new technology. I don't know if I trust it. Well, technically it's not. We've had this technology around for over 10 years and it is the first time we are using it for vaccine development. However, so far we have seen it being safe and effective. Sixth, the pregnancy question. Should pregnant women become vaccinated? In my opinion, yes. Although not specifically studied in pregnancy, COVID-19 actual infection increases the risk to the baby and mother. We have seen very low birth weights associated with COVID-19 infection and increased mortality for the mother and child, unborn child, uh, with true infection. There were some pregnant women who did not know that they were pregnant in the vaccine trial group. None of the women who were pregnant and got the mRNA viruses had any adverse outcomes. Seventh, do we need to still wear a mask after getting the vaccine? The answer is yes. The vaccine protects you from severe disease. However, you can still become infected with the vaccine and possibly spread it to someone else. The chances of this happening are lower with vaccination. However, it is still possible. So please mask up. Okay, so now onto the variants. These have made big news over the past few months. We'll review the three major variants. However, there are about six or seven of them that have already been identified in the literature. The UK variant was first seen at the end of 2020 and helped spread COVID-19 throughout Europe. This virus appears to be a bit more contagious due to enhanced binding of the virus onto the cells. There are some reports that this is more deadly. However, we are not entirely sure. It is beginning to spread in the US and may account for the spike that we saw early in January. Luckily for us, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines provide adequate coverage against this variant. Next up, the South African variant was noted in uh, the fourth quarter of 2020. Again, this is likely more infectious than the original virus, but probably not more deadly. However, it seems as though as vaccine immunity wanes, you might be at an increased risk for getting infected by this variant. There are talks about a booster shot uh, to provide adequate protection. And now the Brazilian variant. This one is by far the most important one to keep an eye on. It is more infectious than the original COVID, but more concerning around this variant is the number of mutations around the spike protein. 
Remember we talked about the lock and key? Well, that key is quite altered in this, but can still pick the lock. And thus the vaccines that we are given may not protect us 100%. If this variant becomes widespread, we may be back to square one and be back to where we were in February and March of 2020. And this is how widespread these variants are at this time. As you can see, quite spread out throughout the country. Luckily, luckily for us, the Brazilian variant is still not widespread. It's only in two areas, Minnesota and Oklahoma. So my outlook, all right, I get this question all the time. Doctor, do you see this coming to an end? When will we be normal? Well, the absolute truth is we don't know, but I am optimistic. I do see light at the end of the tunnel. If we get vaccines out to people and get at least 70% of the population vaccinated, I hope that we can see a normal September. That means no masks, that means business as usual. Right. So now we'll discuss the questions placed by the audience. Okay. Does the two new mask policy work? Sorry, this is a little slow. Yes, uh, the thicker the barrier, the more protection provides. Below is a journal article from Nature, which reviewed multiple masks and reviewed transmission data. It turns out the thicker the mask, the more protection it provides. So you can imagine when you put two masks over each other, the thicker the barrier becomes and thus the less uh, you, you decrease transmission. This is especially more important with the more contagious strains of the virus. Okay. The next question, the virus continues to mutate. How are we to manage? vaccinated. Okay. Uh, well, we have the scientific community working day and night on this. The vaccine manufacturers are already hard at work trying to solve this. As stated earlier, they are developing different versions of the vaccine to tackle different strains or variants of the virus. In my opinion, we will likely have a yearly vaccine which encompasses the significant variants of the year, kind of like the flu vaccine that we do yearly but this is my own speculation. Okay. What is my opinion of herd immunity? Okay, so first off, let's talk about herd immunity. What is herd immunity? So herd immunity is when a large part of the population of an area is immune to a specific disease. If enough people are immune, then the virus cannot infect a large number of people. So we do want herd immunity. However, it is all a matter of how we get there. There is a correct way and an incorrect way. The correct way is through vaccines. We get enough people vaccinated and thus we stop the, stop the viral spread and save a lot of lives. The incorrect way is letting the virus go throughout the population and then we'll lose a lot of people, approximately 1.6% of people. Okay. 
what are COVID-19 long haulers? Is there any help for these people? Well, COVID-19 long haulers are people who have continual symptoms for many months after the disease. Symptoms can be mild or more severe. There are clinics being set up to help people with these symptoms. However, we have noticed that adequate sleep, a healthy diet, and exercise definitely help people get over this. This is a very new virus and we are learning about this every day. So new therapies and approaches are being developed daily. So next, are vaccines approved for children? The short answer is no. At this time, the, young, the youngest age a child can be is 16 to receive a vaccine. There are multiple trials being done regarding the safety and efficacy, and I believe these vaccines are likely safe in children. However, we are being extremely cautious with our younger population. Dr. Fauci believes that by September, we will have children vaccinated. Additionally, the vast majority of children who become infected with COVID-19 have very mild illness. There are some tragic cases. However, this is a very rare exception and definitely not the rule. Next question. Come on. Okay. What is the difference between isolation and quarantine? Well, isolation is usually done at hospitals and it separates sick people with a contagious disease from people who are healthy. Quarantine is usually done at home and that keeps people exposed. It, I'm sorry. And that keeps exposed people at home to limit potential spread to others. Next up. What disinfectants can be used to prevent COVID-19? Well, there are plenty, but here are a few. So sunlight for more than 20 minutes, soap and water, detergents with greater than 60% alcohol, bleach, and there are multiple household cleaning products as well. So if you have a question, you can visit this site at epa.gov slash list and tool to find out whether or not your cleaning product can kill or is licensed to kill COVID-19. Okay. Next, is it safe to go back to school? Can we have in-person learning? So this is a little bit controversial and complicated, so bear with me. The CDC released guidelines yesterday on reopening. These have been met with a lot of criticism from school districts and will be up to the individual school district whether or not they adopt these guidelines. In my opinion, if the high risk population, meaning teachers and adults in the household are vaccinated, then in-person learning can likely resume. Of note, there is an extensive study done in South Korea where they followed over 10,000 families of school children. They found children who were less than 10 years of age had extremely low risk of bringing COVID-19 into the household, whereas this risk was much higher for kids ages 12 or greater. So taking that data into consideration, there, if there is high community spread of the disease at baseline, then perhaps limit in-person learning for kids ages 12 and above but younger kids who may benefit from in-person learning more so may likely stay in the classroom. Again, this is my own opinion. It is very controversial and complicated. Um, so again, just my opinion. Next question. Okay. Is it safe to go to a gym or to a restaurant? So if vaccinated, then you have essentially protected yourself. If unvaccinated, then there is still a risk. All right. If you must go to the gym, 
then please ensure that you maintain social distancing, clean equipment thoroughly, and try to avoid small rooms. Again, try to stay in highly ventilated areas. Are there supplements that can help protect me? Well, there have been multiple studies out there and the results are mixed. The best evidence for supplementation is likely vitamin D. A study found that a large majority of people who were critically ill with COVID had vitamin D deficiencies. Vitamin D is a hormone that helps with your immune system and thus supplementation can be useful. I would not go more than 4,000 units daily. The other supplements such as vitamin C and zinc are likely not as helpful. However, the risk of taking these is quite low, and thus if you want to supplement, then I'm not going to stop you. However, if it is one thing I've learned throughout this entire pandemic, it is how essential it is that we take care of our own bodies. Having a stable diet, exercise, and good sleeping habits are an absolute key to protecting yourself from COVID. I cannot stress this enough. Medications and drugs may help, but there is no I repeat, no substitution to living a healthy lifestyle. As doctors, we can often predict whether or not someone is going to have a complicated time with COVID-19 just by getting a very brief medical history. If you are obese and have multiple comorbidities, you will have a difficult time with COVID. If you are healthy, not so much. So please take care of yourselves and each other. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. If you want to learn more about COVID-19, you can follow my Twitter at Marku at MD. Uh, I try to stay up to date with all the literature and studies. So I try to post articles and thoughts a few times a week. Again, thank you very much. I am quite honored. Thank you very much, Dr. Marku. Mm -hmm. Now it is a question and answer session. Um, question and answer session will be moderated by Dr. Shiv Prasad and Dr. Jyoti Jagdish. Sure. Sir, doctor, you need to unmute. Uh, as most of you know, at least in our Samaja, uh, I'm sure, Prasad, there will be a formal word of thanks at the end of the session. Uh, but I want to take this moment to thank Dr. Marco for making himself available. And I'm sure he is working exceptionally hard during this pandemic, probably a whole lot more than most other doctors. And we appreciate your time. Um, the other reason I want to sincerely thank you is we had planned kind of two halves for the presentation, you know, one half by Dr. Marco and the other one uh, by Dr. Mamadi. Unfortunately, she had to leave for India on a very short notice. Her father needed emergency surgery and she had to be there. And especially for that reason, we thank you again for stepping up to the plate and taking on the responsibility of the entire presentation. And I have to say you did a fantastic job. It was very thorough, very thoughtful and informative. And also in terms of uh, COVID-19, uh, just a little comment, a personal comment I have to make. At least in our lifetime, I can't think of any other disease that has had such an impact, a worldwide impact on really minutia of our day-to-day -day living, you know, whether it is going to school, going to work, uh, airline, because I travel once a month, just going to your local grocery store, uh, sometimes even going to your own mailbox. If you remember during the early part, people were afraid to go to the mailbox because there was this rumor that postmen were sick, but they were still showing up to work and they were spreading COVID. So that way, I think this has had a far reaching effect, both emotionally, socially, um, and financially for the entire world. 
Now, in terms of the questions, you know, at least the way I had understood some of these questions we would read, but looks like Dr. Marku got uh, advanced notice of the questions and he already um, answered most of them. So I'm gonna just quickly look through and perhaps I will, um, because he, he pretty much answered every one of them in this isolation and quarantine, vitamin supplementation, mutation, the new strains, herd immunity. Um, so maybe I'll make up a couple of my own questions if that's okay with you, all mm -hmm. right? So number one, you know, I, I did mention about travel, okay? Um, and unfortunately I do have to travel at least once every month. What is your view and of course the medical knowledge out there as Dr. Marco clearly mentioned, this is one disease which has really humbled all of us, including the experts in the field. Okay, and we are learning on the fly and we are improvising on a day-to-day -day basis depending on what we have learned so far. So humility definitely helps in this situation. Airline travel, mm -hmm. how safe is it? Um, go ahead and answer that question, please. Okay, so... With everything that we do, like I said, everything we do has risk, okay? Now, I will cite one study uh, that was done in China, um, again, early in the pandemic, which looked at travel in a high-speed high bullet train. And there are, I think, five seats in a row, uh, followed by probably 10, uh, 10 rows of seats. And they looked at one person who sat in the middle of the train, okay? And he was infected with COVID-19. So then they found everybody from that train and they found that after this person had boarded the train multiple times and they monitored him, they you know, rounded up all the people that he was around. And there was only about a 3% chance of him infecting his direct neighbor. So the, the person who was, he's sitting next to directly, there's only about a 3% chance of him infecting that person. And this, again, mind you, this is before masks were being worn 100% of the time. So if you include that, as well as all of the increased ventilation that we do when we you know, board a plane, um, it's probably a lot less than 3%. So if you're vaccinated, I think it's probably a very safe means of travel. If you're not vaccinated, it, it might be, you know, 1%, maybe a little bit less, but again, still a risk. If you are at a high risk population, you have a lot of comorbidities, you know, you're quite older in age, let's say older than 65, I wouldn't have my parents board that plane. But if you know you are on the younger side, you're healthy, you don't have a laundry list of medications that you take, then I think it's a reasonable risk to take if you're going for a good purpose. Now, if you're just going to travel to Las Vegas to gamble your livelihood away, mm -hmm. all right, probably not a smart idea. But if it's you know for work purposes or for your livelihood, then then I think it's you know a, a reasonable risk to take, um, as long as you know you try to keep a mask on. Um, and, and whatnot. And for the next question, Dr. Jyoti. As you said, I think Dr. Marku has answered most of the questions. Um, the other thing that would come to mind, and I think it's a myth, and obviously it's a myth, but still, we've heard few of them being tested positive for COVID after the vaccine, and they seem to blame that the COVID is the one that a COVID vaccine is the reason for the positive results. What do you say about that? Yeah, so co the, the vaccines that we've developed do not inject you with any kind of live virus. If you test positive after getting a vaccine, that means that you've come in contact with somebody who had COVID and exposed to the virus. The vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID at all. It prevents you from getting very sick from COVID. So you could technically get the vaccine, develop an immune uh, antibodies, and then come in contact with COVID, you will likely test positive for COVID, but you won't get sick. And that's the whole purpose of the vaccine, that you don't get sick, 
or severely ill. You might have very mild symptoms, but nothing, nothing uh, major. Uh, I had a question. Pardon? Uh, I had a question. Can I? Oh, sure. Hold on. I think uh, I, I muted all of them. Um, Girish, if you have any question, can you pass me in the chat? Okay. So as we are waiting for that question, if I may. Uh, you spoke about the contraindications for immunization, okay? And of course, with Guillain Barre, with mm -hmm. the flu vaccine being contraindicated, what is the evidence in terms of a person who's had Guillain Barre? Can they get this vaccine? So, out of the two million, over two million uh, COVID vaccines that we've given, we had zero Guillain Barre. Uh, cases. So we don't think that there is uh, a correlation between Guillain-Barre and uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So the CDC, there's, there's a statement on the CDC regarding this, um, mm -hmm. and they recommend that if somebody has gone, gotten Guillain-Barre from influenza vaccine, that it's still likely okay that they get um, the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, this is the mRNA, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson and, and um, Sputnik and AstraZeneca vaccines, they're a little bit different. Their mechanisms are a little different. So I don't think that we, uh, until they get heard by Congress and you know we have these whole hearings, I, I don't think we'll have formal recommendations on that yet. Dr. Jagdish, any questions from you next? I think you have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. What about patients with ankylosing spondylitis? They usually have hyperimmunity and you know, few suggest that they would uh, respond ad adversely with the COVID vaccine. Uh, I think uh, in, you know, that case in particular, I think uh, it's probably safe uh, to get uh, the mRNA vaccines. Um, like I said, I don't know enough about the um, side effects of the other uh, vaccines, the, the uh, adenovirus um, vector vaccines or the protein-based vaccines. Um, but I do think the mRNA vaccines, it, it, it is um, likely okay for ankylosing spondylitis. Again, if, if anyone has any questions, please ask the question in the chat. I'm passing the questions to Dr. Shuprasa, Dr. Jyoti, uh, Jyoti Jagdish. All right, so as we're waiting to uh, get the questions, my next question is about contact tracing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because it's been very disappointing in terms of the percentage of people who participate in contact tracing. Because one of the reports right out of New Jersey is that approximately 73% of the people didn't even bother to call back the uh, Department of Health after they were contacted knowing that they had been exposed to the virus. So that's part one. The other side of the coin is, you know, because uh, both my wife and I, we are proceduralists, all patients have to get a COVID test done and be negative before they can come in for the procedure. And it so happens quite frequently where, you know, one of our patients has turned up positive. I call them, I say, I mean, unfortunately, you can't come for your procedure tomorrow or the day after. And then I follow up with them five to seven days later. One, are you having any symptoms? How are you doing? Out of concern for them. And I also ask them, has the Department of Health called you? 
nobody from the Department of Health has called these people who have tested positive. So from both sides, it's very disappointing. Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree with you. Um, unfortunately, um, in the United States, um, we've done a pretty abysmal uh, job at contact tracing. You look at other countries such as Sweden, you look at um, Germany, you look at um, even Spain and Portugal, even Canada, um, contract tracing has been phenomenal, it, especially even in the Asian countries like Japan, it's phenomenal. I mean, if you, you know, even, you know, just briefly come in contact with somebody, you'll get a phone call saying, you know, you were exposed uh, to, to COVID-19. I think there's a, a underlying distrust in the American communities um, of giving out personal information and that kind of um, distrust kind of breaks apart uh, the whole contract tracing philosophy. So uh, until the average American can trust their medical professionals and their Department of Health, then contract tracing is going to be um, an uphill battle. Uh, Dr. Shiv Prasad, Dr. Jagdish, um, I'm posting the questions in the WhatsApp chat and in the Zoom. Yeah, I can see Sorry, some. So the next question is, how long does the immunity last from the vaccine? Okay, so we, we don't know 100%. However, we are um, hopeful that it, it is at least six months to a year. It looks like natural infection gets you at least six months of, of uh, immunity. So if you've been infected with COVID-19, you probably have at least six months of protection. With the vaccine, um, again, you toss on another, at least another six months to possibly one year. Now, again, this kind of all changes a little bit with the variants that um, we talked about. So with the UK variant, um, you are likely protected. With the South African variant, um, as the uh, immunity wanes, so towards month five and six, you are at increased risk for getting uh, an infection from that variant. And for the Brazilian variant, there is almost no protection. If I may ask the next question, and the question is, if one member in the family is vaccinated, what precautions should the family have to take? I, I guess, what precautions should any other members in the family take? Um, I would probably say just pretend that person is not vaccinated. So just pretend like nobody's vaccinated. If only one person has protection because it doesn't protect them from spreading the virus, that vaccinated person from spreading the virus to the unvaccinated people. Only when everybody in the household is vaccinated is when everybody can kind of resume business as usual. And I think we're really a long way off from that <laughs> time, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Go ahead, please, Dr. Jack. This next question from yeah. you. So the next question would be, after getting vaccinated, what is the risk level of traveling on an international long haul flight? Minimal, very minimal. Um, like I said, you can come in contact with the virus, but the chances of you getting ill, severely ill, um, given that you've been vaccinated with one of the mRNA vaccines is, is you know, minimal. So the, the um, Pfizer and the Moderna protect you from, from severe disease by 95, 96%. Thank you. Right, and this question may have been partially answered already, but I'm gonna read the question anyway. Is there any group of people who should not get the vaccination or should be cautious in getting the COVID-19 vaccination? Yes, yeah, so as of right now, the CDC only recommends against vaccination in people who have polyethylene glycol or polysorbate allergies. Now, there also is another um, camp of people 
who have multiple allergies to a variety of other um, substances. So if you, you know, go to an allergist and he has a whole laundry list of, you know, 20 to 30 different substances that you have allergies to, then I would have a sit down talk with your allergist or your physician and kind of weigh the pros and cons of being vaccinated. Um, but the, as of right now, those are the only two groups of people that, um, you know, being that is vaccination, you know, warranted or should they be vaccinated? Dr. Jigvish, yes. next question. <clears throat> <I'm, clears throat> this is from Basavraj Hiremat. I am a mediator and a teacher. Through my studies, those who are practicing breathing regularly have not tested positive. Do you have any studies that support it? Um, I'm not sure what. Breathing. I think that could be meditation. Yeah, meditation. Or, or yoga. That could be a type. <laughs> that could be a typo. Okay. Um, I, I do not know of, of any uh, breathing exercises to limit um, uh, your chances of getting COVID or getting severe disease from COVID. All right, then and if, um, go ahead, please. Is it okay for me to read the next question? Oh, sure, please do. Okay. A recent European study has shown that population with sour foods in their diet, yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, etc., have less infection rate. They're attributing it to good gut bacteria. Exposure to sunlight is also considered a positive factor. Your comments? Okay, so uh, a couple things here. So um, people who, so first thing, the gut microbiome, which is the uh, bacteria in the gut, there's still plenty and plenty and plenty to, to learn about. So we are still in the dark ages in regards to truly understanding gut bacteria, gut health, and how it affects the entire body. Now, in regards to the, the particular diet of yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, um, and others, those are kind of healthy foods. So you can imagine that people eating those types of foods are a little bit on the healthier side than people eating McDonald's and Wendy's and pizza and you know all the other fatty types of foods. So when, like I said, the, the things that, um, that protect you from COVID is actually having a good immune system, being healthy and, and you know, exercising good sleep hygiene and exercise. So if these people are eating a good diet, they are likely in the healthier category and thus have better outcomes with COVID. In regards to exposure to sunlight, um, we do know that sunlight causes an increase in vitamin D levels. And as I stated in the presentation, that vitamin D might be a protective factor in uh, uh, COVID. So, you know, does sunlight help? Uh, possibly. All right. So far, that's the end of the questions. Uh, there is one more question just came. Um, I'm going to give you that one. Uh -huh. uh, give me one second. Okay, I I posted in the WhatsApp chat for you guys. Dr. Jagdish, your turn, please. If a person has had Epstein-Barr virus, can that person take this vaccine? Likely, yes. Um, now, I, I kind of also need to know a little bit of information in regards to what medications are on. So if they are on steroids, for instance, for whatever reason, they might have a blunted immune response um, to the vaccine. However, um, it, it would be a case-to-case -case basis and, and kind of um, go from there. Now, Epstein-Barr virus in and of itself would not um, alter your immune response, but um, steroids, if you were on steroids or immune altering uh, drugs, then it might.
All right, the next question, um, to a certain extent partially answered already, does breathing exercises help to relieve the effects of COVID-19 along with medical care? So the only breathing stuff that I can think of that helps with COVID-19 is prone positioning, which means laying on your belly. So we, we do know that if you lay on your belly, your, your oxygen levels rise um, as you're on your, on your belly breathing. So whenever I go into a room to see a COVID patient, I kind of scold them if they're not laying on their belly when I you know, see them. So that does help, but in regards to certain breathing exercises that are associated with yoga and things like that, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure, I'm not, you know, I haven't seen any literature or scientific studies looking at that. Dr. Jagadish, next question yeah. please. So the next question would be, mRNA vaccines are new. I'm not sure how anyone can claim that there isn't any long-term effects with reference to this. What are your comments on that? So you're right. We had This is a, a, a novel type of um, vaccine mode. Um, however, the vaccine kind of degrades after two months of the, the mRNA, degrades after two months of receipt. So um, the effects that you... The, the long-term effects that you will ex experience um, should be seen within that two month or up to, you know, let's say six months. All the trials that have been done on these 100,000 patients on the mRNA vaccines between Fi Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, um, have not seen any kind of long-term side effects. They've been monitoring them like hawks. I mean, I've also signed up for the, um, vaccine um, surveys. So, you know, uh, Pfizer and, and whatnot also, you know, reach out to me and ask me how I'm doing and, and whatnot. And given I'm not a full two months out, but they are on top of me like hawks, uh, at least a couple times a week. They ask me how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, if I see any kind of um, disruption in my day to day. So given how they've been um, very thorough with even just me. I can only imagine how thorough they are with the people who are in the, the actual trials. Um, and so far, we haven't seen anything to suggest that there are um, significant uh, side effects. Thank you. Dr. Shiv Prasad. All right, the next question is, can the vaccinated person in a family infect other family members? So the question is technically, yes. Um, the vaccine only protects you. It only protects you from getting severely ill. You can get the vaccine, develop antibodies, and then go out to a party, have, you know, come in contact with somebody who has COVID-19. You will harbor the virus for some time. If you go back home and, you know, are uh, have dinner with your family or hug them or watch, you know, TV with them or, or whatnot, there's a chance that you could be exposing them. So at that point, they, um, they can become infected. And that's why we encourage that even vaccinated people should still wear a mask. Now, I will note that the degree of you spreading it to someone is probably less than if you were not vaccinated at all. There's been a recent study in Israel which showed that there was a decreased transmission of people who are over 65 spreading it to other people who are over 65. And the reason for that is, or even people who are over 65 spreading it to younger people. And the reason for that is everybody over the age of 65 in Israel is vaccinated. Israel has done a phenomenal job in regards to vaccination. So all of their elderly population are vaccinated and they're not seeing a lot of um, 65 year olds infect other people. So that means that the chance of you infecting somebody is lower than um, somebody not vaccinated at all, but it's still not zero. They're still seeing some cases, but it's not, um, it doesn't compare to people who are not vaccinated. Thank you. 
Um, what could be the one reason for less severity of the pandemic in India, which is thickly populated? Um, that I'm not sure. Um, it, I, I don't know the, the uh, I, I will say this, the COVID is a highly politicized um, uh, topic. And, and I don't know enough about the, the politics of India because I do know that China doesn't really, is not very forthcoming with their data. Um, if you look at their data as the US was surging throughout their, their surge in, in uh, April and May, uh, the, the virus was almost gone in China, which I, I, I don't really believe. Um, I, I don't know enough, and, and I'm not going to, you know, claim I'm an expert in, in India um, to, to say that I know what's going on over there, but I, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know what the access of care is over there, so, so I'm, I'm kind of ill-equipped to answer that question. Um, obviously, I live in India, and I've lived in India before, so ventilation could be a possibility, I'm thinking. The reason being that we don't live in a closed uh, room and we do not have the ventilators. So it's mostly uh, cross ventilation from windows and uh, you know bright sunlight and that type of an environment. Might be. Yeah, Dr. Shiv Prasad. If I may add my two cents, just as a, a matter of observation, okay? Not as a specialist in the field. We closed our office on March 17th of 2020. And as I closed the doors, because I mean, obviously it's patient care, but it's also a business because I worry about other businesses. How do they pay the bills? And as you may probably know, more than 100,000 restaurants in New Jersey have permanently given up their license. Mm -hmm. And this was three months ago. I, I have no idea how many more. That's many lives affected, you know, with parents not being able to take care of the needs of their children, their textbooks, computers, a lot of things that we take for granted. So on that day, as we walked out and I closed the doors, I was thinking, I was naive in retrospect, that in two weeks, everything will be under control and we'll come back and get to some semblance of normalcy. So we are, what, uh, mid-February now? So approximately 11 months later, I, I think we are in the throngs of this infection much worse than we were, or at least we knew a year ago. So my heart definitely goes out to all the people who are affected by the virus. So the second thought I had at that point in time is, okay, it's February, March, it's cold, there's no sunlight. Come June, July, August, this will be history. Not so, okay. Summer came and went and uh, winter is here and about to end and we are still suffering from that. So, and to take off from that comment, you know, in terms of history, it's always said that people who live through history don't quite realize that they're living through history. And we are in fact living through history for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years down the road just as we talk about the flu of uh, 1917 or the Hong Kong flu of the 1960s. And I think to a greater extent, this infection will be studied, written up and talked about for probably thousands of years to come. And that's a very humbling thought, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was more a comment rather than a yeah. question, okay. <laughs> Very well said. Any final comments from Dr. Jagdish, Dr. Markov? Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity um, that you guys have given me to speak with you. Um, again, COVID-19 is a truly humbling um, virus. I've been wrong about COVID-19 many times and I have stuck my foot in my mouth. Um, so I try to, it, I think it's actually made me a better physician and scientist, um, because I try to stay up to date with all of the literature. Um, and, um, you know, there are no absolutes in, in medicine or, or life in general. So, um, uh, you know, wish you all the best. And like I said, take care of yourselves and each other.
Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending uh, today's session, uh, especially uh, Dr. Markov. Thank you very much for 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 hosting this one. This is wonderful. I think uh, we can all agree that when everyone uh, has has learned so much about about COVID today. Um, then thank you, Dr. Jagdish, Dr. Shiv Prasad, for moderating the questions. Okay. Uh, thank 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 you, Trisha Jia, for your melodious rendition of the prayer. Okay. Thank you all. Stay safe and good night. I will end the meeting now. Sharanu Sharanarthigal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.